Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for all of you for being here this evening with us or this afternoon. Uh, I'm Tanoz Farsi, professor in the Department of Art and particularly in sculpture. And it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Julia Fish today for the Department of Art's uh, final visiting artist lecture of the year. Julia joins us from Chicago, where she has lived and worked since 1985. Born in Toledo, Oregon, she completed her BFA at PNCA in Portland, Oregon, and received her MFA from AMICA, Maryland Institute uh, College of Art in Baltimore. Julia is now Professor Emeriti at the University of Illinois, Chicago. My colleague, uh, Amanda Wojcik, who wishes she could be here tonight, uh, uh, writes this of uh, Julia's work. For many years, Julia's paintings and drawings have been inspired by her immediate surroundings, specifically a selection of architectural details within her home, closely observed, deeply considered, and devotionally transformed these details, such as floor tiles, stairways, la stairway landings, and thresholds between spaces have provided a rich and complex set of source material. Although precise, exact, and organized, her paintings are also filled with vibration, motion, visual, and spatial murmurs. With a profound sensitivity towards color, space, and light, her work is not only an extraordinary refiguring of the everyday, but it is also engaged in an astute and specific conversation with other paintings throughout time. And I just want to make a personal note that in our class uh, the other day, we read a bit of your writing, uh, the piece on Cezanne, the skulls. And it was so incredible, this unfolding that happened as we discussed this reading and that uh, the, the, the way that Amanda discusses that exactness and specificity on allowing us to enter a painting through your eyes and embody that space was incredibly powerful. So thank you for the writing that you do as well. Uh, curated exhibitions of Julia's work include the Renaissance Society, University of Chicago, Gallery of Mize in Austria, the 2010 Whitney Biennial, and a 10-year solo survey bound by spectrum at the DePaul Art Museum in Chicago. And some of you may remember our uh, visit from Julia Rodriguez Whitholm uh, a few years ago, who, who was the curator for this particular survey at DePaul. Julia's work is included in the permanent collection of the Art Institute of Chicago, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Denver Art Museum, Museum of Modern Art New York, among others. She's represented by Rona Hoffman Gallery Chicago and David Nolan Gallery in New York. We're so happy to welcome her here today and back to her home state uh, after many months and en of energetic planning and anticipation for her lecture titled Homework, Paintings, Picture Thinking, and Notes in Progress. Please join me in welcoming Julia Fish. Are you hearing me now? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you, Tanaz, uh, for the introduction and um, choking me up a little bit myself about the Cezanne project. I'll, it's, it's, what, it's one of the things that towards the end of the presentation that I, I will come back to, but uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here, and it was pointed out to me this afternoon that with, after three years of waiting that I also um, find myself here in the right season as Oregon is in bloom uh, substantially ahead of Chicago. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm very happy to um, join you and Tanaz mentioned um, that, the, that Amanda had offered that initial invitation. So. Um, a great shout out to Amanda for sustaining and um, 
re continuing to re-invite me, despite the fact that the world changed, as we all know. It's a pleasure also that I will have the opportunity tomorrow to meet with the MFA grads at the Schnitzer uh, Museum. And um, I thought I would get there today, but it's tomorrow, so I'll be speaking off the cuff. And I look forward to meeting, um, let's see. I think I have everyone's name, but I didn't practice, sorry. Lily Y. Brennan, Mary Evans, Anastasia Gutnick, David Pena, and William Zhang. Uh, thesis exhibition at the museum, and as I understand it, all in one room together, and we'll have a conversation together tomorrow morning. I've included the quote, their work diversely represents a range of media and practices, very contemporary spanning ecofeminism, social practice, um, ranging also through speculative fiction. That's interesting. Fundamental joy, we need that. Ideas about representation through the materiality of painting. Um, so I thank you for that invitation to time it with a conversation with you. Uh, Mr. Bergson's book, um, I, I turn back and forth through it, and um, this quote seems particularly timely still. Our perceptions are undoubtedly interlaced with memories, and inversely, a memory only becomes actual by borrowing the body of some, pre of some perception into which it slips. Borrowing the body, the body could be that represented. The body could be the thing that's been painted. Um, the body could be the book written. The body could be this screen that we carry around in our pocket. Where, where is that body, and um, how can this observation from decades back um, continue to inform us, and so that we don't forget that our understanding travels backwards and forwards through time and requires reactivating. I also want to thank Wendy Heldman, Research Associate and Program Manager Extraordinary. I think all of you know that. Um, for her patience and organization of the details for the visit. Indeed, a special thanks um, again to Amanda and um, the warm reception I've had meeting faculty this afternoon. Amanda's or original invitation to visit in April of 2020 was, of course, deferred due to the global pandemic. I do have a heightened awareness of, I guess let's say, some time travel that's specific to joining you this afternoon, as I've internalized a sense of expectation of speaking about my work from that time, constantly re-engaged. And I recognize that the studio work shifted since then. Inevitably, for me, as for everyone, the work, your world. Through so much uncertainty, I was unexpectedly fortunate to have been offered what I now know were fortunate detours, sorry, fortunate detours and opportunities and I plan to describe some of those later in the presentation, and one of those was that opportunity to consider Cezanne's work. In the interest of time, I have prepared my comments as a text, and I hope it will be useful and perhaps somewhat efficient. Um, but if there is a, a point of uncertainty or a question that seems really time-specific, while there's an image on the slide, I certainly don't mind being interrupted, but I will also welcome your questions at the conclusion. 
Can everyone really hear me at the back? You're good? You're good. Great. I'm reaching back to a few earlier works through the lecture, um, through the presentation, uh, images of my own work from the 80s and 90s, and I'm including some um, references of works of art and architecture, as Amanda and uh, Tanaz mentioned. A, a, a kind of documentation selected uh, that would hopefully describe how things change when we encounter something we haven't expected to see. Let me just go back here. So what do I mean by picture thinking? It's not just about paintings. I approach making an image in whatever material as an act of picturing, of presenting or representing an image of something that I have seen and experienced directly. Just as Mr. Bergson guided us. The book stack is the clue that allows me to revise, rethink, recall. It's not unusual that I would write something in the studio book and think, gee, did I say that already? Did I write that already? And I'd go back and indeed find it. So um, if, you're not, if you're making images and a practice of notation is not yet part of a habit, I, I could encourage that. All of my work is titled, what I call working titles, and that's why the books, the notebooks are so useful. I see language as an ally, and, an, and the notebooks keep track of that. A primary concern continues to be the scale of the given subject and my physical relationship to it. What do I see, and from what point of view? What are the implications of the subject when it is lifted from the world and engages the subject of painting, of drawing, of photography, of performing? Proximity is perhaps one of the strongest elements of my work, that, that sense that the thing I'm, I've encountered is near me. Another element was, it was reminded, uh, William Zhang reminded me this afternoon, um, a word that I had failed to include in my notes this afternoon, and I appreciate it, that the subject of duration. And that's especially true, I'll speak to that when addressing the images from the house, that it's the constancy of encountering the same environment that seems the same until it's not until the point of view changes or the context in which our reactions to the world allow us to see things differently. Or gee, I'm just finally focusing on something that was there all the time, but it hadn't raised itself to my consciousness, or I hadn't been able to identify that. So uh, this slide is a, is a an eccentric moment, but continues to be um, informative. Um, in a, it's a reminder. What we see on the left is an interior wall, bricks. The first studio space that I had in Chicago on Hubbard Street with Richard Rezac. After working in gouache drawings on paper, one day I just impulsively just cleaned the palette by identifying each brick as a color. And it just lived with that moment in the studio during the time that I worked there. 
about a year after um, being in Chicago in that first studio, the building was sold, happens. We found an apartment and another studio space some distance away. And a few months later, I was walking along State Street and I realized that the building we had occupied had been torn down, demolished. I looked up and it's a little hard to see because this is pre-digital world, but up here <coughs> is that moment. And I completely dumbfounded, took the bus back home to the apartment, got the camera, came back, documented it because I was so stunned that this private interior studio moment was, was there and um, it was, I was compelled to, to, folk, to, to document that. Uh, of course, a new building replaced the building we had occupied. So that moment is between two walls in, still to, to this day. Those first uh, few years in uh, Chicago, walking from studio home, home to studio, pretty much every other day between work. So I, I have just a, a few paintings from that time. I would, heart, I would turn this as a merge of life in Oregon and life in Chicago. Um, Part of the sense of scale is where's, what, where's the edge? Many of my paintings are easel, easel size, although I work on the wall. So I, I need, for the most part, to be able to carry my own paintings. There's so, some exceptions to that later. But um, I see that space in this early work and still as a, in relation to the body, in relation to, to what I take in in the immediate space uh, in front of me. I'm including this because I was taught to draw in arts. I, I, I drew in high school. I had great classes in, in, at, in, at PNCA called the Museum School because we were right next to the collection. That was informative and influential. Um, mostly we draw by putting lines around things. And I was stunned to have uh, summers in Chicago and the, the, a lightning bolt was a line and it was a thing, not around anything. So there was, to me this was another kind of electric, if, if you will, moment for me. This is an example of many images that I come across and certainly hadn't expected. Suddenly there was an opportunity for travel and the correlation obvious here. Almost the pine, is the pine tree trying to disappear into the brick or vice versa? And the fundamental difference and, and shared, but shared scale of the vertical and the horizontal. And um, still informative for me. I have lived and worked in this house that Amanda referenced, and it has shaped my work to a substantial degree. I've described my interest in expanding the frame of home towards other definitions, including perhaps home as a deeper awareness of searching for or being at home or not at home with oneself. Indeed, it's fair to say that I could not have accomplished the work that I'm presenting if not for the direct experience of all of the images that I'm including here 
for you this evening, but uh, um, of course edited. That goes back to that picture thinking part. In the house, um, I developed um, drawings and paintings that uh, were primarily informed by life on the second floor. Uh, the studio that I occupy is across a garden, small garden in the back, in a, uh, a brick, we can call it a garage, but no longer. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in this from built con uh, concurrent with the house. So the kind of structure authority that you see in this storefront, very typical 1922 um, in Chicago. That's, that structure is also the, the exterior cladding experience that I encounter on a daily basis. The first paintings in the house from the second floor, one to one scale. What size is the painting of frost? It's the size of the glass that the frost is on. Same with ivy, different season, pressed against. If you come to the house, this is the street level. You open the door, you come in. From 97 till about 2001, I developed drawings and paintings collectively titled Entry based on that small site that you just saw. Tracing the tiles at actual size established this plan that served as a template for work that followed. I indulged and animated and appreciated the irregular nature of the handset tiles the inconsistencies with what appears to be a regular pattern. So this isn't really a wonky slide, it's a wonky floor. It's a, it's a handset floor that's at least a half inch or an inch larger in, on one dimension to the other. And I certainly didn't understand that until the transfer of that pattern directly onto paper and then subsequently printed and um, used as a template. A set of fragment images developed and were painted sequentially. It was a hunch, I'd start one, and um, this is, as you can tell, then a fragment from the left side. In the process of doing the drawings, for each of the, what became a set of multiple fragments. Um, there was a moment before the color was added and I suddenly understood that in, at, as a negative, that I could apply another kind of thinking. We have the physical and we have what? The translucent or the, the permeable space a web being caught. So eventually there was a set of four descriptive images that circled around that center motif that I didn't dare really address until um, about a, a year later. They have a slightly um, independent cast. For example, the um, fourth fragment at the upper center has a very bluish tint to the paint. I was fortunate to travel to Vienna in summer of 99 to see paintings and architecture where I encountered this work by Max Fabiani along the Ungar Gasse, a narrow street in Vienna's third district. The facade was impossible to see in its entirety from any one vantage point. I had to walk its length back and forth along the opposite side of the street. And um, 
at a later visit, I, um, I, I went every other day just to see this um, tiled, um, reflective surface capturing um, the light at different times of day. You can see at the edge, this was also a knockout. Right here, along this edge, the tiles were shaped to turn the corner. And, the, and similarly, it's hard to see in this, it's, they similarly, similarly wrap the window edges. So for those of you who make paintings and stretch your own canvases, suddenly this tile facade had um, it was a painting. It was um, stretching as in a taut direction uh, as a painting. When I came back to Chicago, I had, the, I had had the experience of working with this as a site, but I had the experience of walking the Ungar Gasse and um, imagined that the border of the entry could approximate an experience that I w had been quite taken by. So I, in a sense, disassembled the border in sequence, but placed in sequence, and um, began work on a kind of fictional frieze or um, uh, tribute to the embodied and the absent. Not lost on me is that the patterns, as I added and subtracted, um, ended very deliberately here with uh, almost the two. So um, as, as a squared, like an experience squared, I was loving that. I began a set of drawings based on the second floor plan of the rooms on, in the Hermitage House. The living spaces that I occupied moved through. Um, I used the plan of the floor as the basis for a set of drawings and identified what became 10 independent um, spaces that included a room and a threshold space to an adjacent. Room. So, for example, the threshold, this sort of schematic, very abbreviated version of the threshold here, is the same threshold that exists here. And we can see that in the south and north oriented rooms lined up that how the um, sort of puzzled shapes um, act independently and in very animated form in, in several instances. Those then became a set of drawings. Each um, room had its own gouache in this sort of warmish tint. And a partner, same size, same placement um, as a shadow of itself. So those were sets of 10 and 10. That led to a set of paintings that, I'll go back to William's word about duration. Um, in this case, it wasn't only duration of, of living in that, uh, in, through an experience, but um, how to have a set of 10 paintings that would be um, completed concurrently. And so they're a set, they're not sequential. They were not a series, I knew there would be 10. But I wanted the integrity of that set to exist as if concurrent. So a very interesting problem for those who make paintings. If you change your mind, and you scrape something away, you've really changed the surface, or you dissolve it, or you rub it away. Or 
you change the color radically because you think that's the thing to do and it doesn't work out. I, if I made the wrong move, I was obligated to make the wrong move on all 10 paintings and in a sense kind of mimic the error and retain the construction of the set. It was a, I, I had to figure out how to do that and then make that commitment. It was interesting. This is actually a room and a hallway. The um, illuminated elements um, that you're seeing uh, indicate a light fixture or a window or a kind of action. So that's the subtitle, which I borrow f happily from filmmaking, performance. An exhibition of that work in 2005 in New York was a bit dizzy making as an ex as a exhibition experience. Um, architecture has been joined into my practice in a in very informative way through travel, but especially because I live in one of the greatest architectural cities in the world, and um, that. Moving there was not the reason, but it, it didn't take long for that to inform a, and, and continues to educate me about um, urban space, materiality. Um, we're fortunate to have a river, and the river opens up the space in a very dynamic way, just like Portland harks back. What we're seeing here is Venturi and Scott Brown, uh, Denise Scott Brown's um, remarkable tribute to Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia, it's, it's sort of familiarly called the Ghost House. And uh, I first saw this in 2008 on a visit to Philadelphia. One of the remarkable things is that in the flagstones under the house, um, excerpts of the correspondence between Franklin and his wife are excerpted and incised into the, into the surface of the stonework. And then other markings indicate where there was a fireplace or certain kind of um, activity specific that could be articulated in, uh, into the ground uh, plan of the, of the plaza. So a, vo a, a very intimate voice in a public space was, in, was important for me. That particular quote, two stories of stairs ramped, bracketed, and wainscoted, um, encouraged me to um, think about the two stairways the east and the west in the house. Um, the front has a more embellished nose, as they say. Um, the west is a practical back porch enclosed stairway. The west stairway leads to the garden. I have a mirror in the studio, and that mirror has at various times had an influence in the kind of thinking that the work does. And indeed, not only were the stairways mirroring their uh, performance of space, but the mirror itself offered an opportunity for me to think about that more actively. Um, this one, one of the works was installed at a similar stairway in Oak Park in 2011. In 2006 and 7, uh, Richard Rizek was a fellow at the American Academy, and I was a fortunate um, traveling um, a companion um, and was able to start to think about um, other kinds of images 
figurative, for example, as well as architecture, that performed something that I was thinking about. I was in the middle of work on the stairs and landings for that year, and um, th this particular view of Santa Cecilia from the is, is something that one can't see. You can only see it in the postcard. And so this image, uh, finding two images that were oppositional of the same embodied um, saint was uh, something that, this is a view from the studio space that I had at the academy. So I had images of the house and Santa Cecilia to guide me. The exchange between East and West. So the study for East Landing, formal front, more or less, with the East Stairs profile, which we saw earlier, but borrowing the color of the West Stairway. I was it's maybe it's somewhat legible in these images. Oh my, this is not the right green, I'm sorry to say. It's more blue-green, so something's happening uh, with the projector. But in any event, the, the, these images were made by overlaying the brown and the green, the brown and the green, the brown and the green. Hence, we have this sort of suggestion of a tiled structure that is supporting the um, profile of the small stair. Again, the west gets to borrow the color from the east. In 2008 and 9, the only paintings that came directly from this work um, went through um, a sort of happy experience. This was when Obama was elected, and you know, through the whole election, I was starting to sort of think about this and. Um, that there were two parts to one experience. Um, it was, this is a very positive um, experience to make these paintings as partners. This is a close up, gives you a sense that I'm using the grid of, this, of, the, of the weave of the canvas and uh, repeatedly pressing um, the paint into the profile it approximates a kind of marble or pla fine plaster um, as a silhouette. In 2010, I was invited to participate in the Whitney Biennial, and artists were invited to send some video that they individually made to the Whitney. and. Um, Individuals at the Whitney then edited kind of teaser for it, each artist. And um, this is, let's see if I can activate this. I was beginning the threshold project <coughs> for the three paintings that were shown at the Whitney.
the first set of three. Let me go back for just a moment. You'll notice that south and east are both capitalized and so on, southwest and so on. North, of, of course, gets its own word. Um, but that deliberate capitalization is another form of partnering that the orientation, south doesn't get privilege over west in that word. Um, for, and same for southeast. The assignment of color was given to six thresholds. We have three primary and three secondary colors in our color basic understanding. And uh, green was first because, of course, everything was still green there. That was, that was a given. But um, the remaining colors were, I, were I gradually started to figure out that it had to do with light and directionality, just as I showed you the floor plan that with the numbers of windows that face to the south. So light and color determined the um, location of the six. A subjective and objective partnership, if you will. So with the six, um, which stretched over a period of time from about 2010 to 2014-15, along with that came uh, works on paper that followed the work. Rather than studies for um, the painting, um, these were uh, works on paper. These are just three emblematic of many um, for each of the six paintings. The paper on which this uh, set of trace drawings were completed is a bit of a luminescent, translucent paper itself. And the um, ink sits up on the surface, doesn't absorb into the paper in quite the same way. I've often um, described a, another element of picture thinking is that, yes, there's a site. and. I'm, I become committed to it, but then there's another, there's another version, there's another way to think about that same site. So in a way, this uh, blocky image is the architectural lift from the floor plan of the space preceding the door, the door and a small space on the other side. So just to be clear. This space that you saw in the video um, is, on, in architectural plan terms, this, but now given um, the identity of blue, but blue with its partner color. So along with the primary, secondary um, determination, I wasn't avoiding its, its complementary voice. So just as the stairs and landings were made of east and west. The threshold paintings and works on paper um, employ a partnership um, in a strong way with its, um, with its complementary other. From the six thresholds, I'm not sure, I don't have images of all of them for you tonight, but they're on a website um, to find. The six of them together stretched out over time, and I, was, I became really fascinated with the templates that I drew, one-to-one -one scale of each threshold, with the, te with the templates' similarities and differences to each other. Some have wood that meets a threshold, and then tile, for example, which you saw. Some are just wood, but with their orientation, in the house, the wood is north is east west, but the threshold could move across north south, uh, as you see here. So, um, going back to this template for a moment, 
with the exception of the green threshold, all of the, all of the threshold paintings are 23 inches high, and yet they seem to um, ha articulate different kinds of spatial awareness and experience um, individually as the six. I was fascinated with the prospect that if they overlaid and were still legible, they would be a threshold of the second floor. It would be an, an encompassing matrix, that kind of meaning of matrix. And um, this was one of several drawings that helped me start to understand what happens if color then is identified along with um, its given identification it's given place. So we are seeing uh, uh, the st standard sequence from science and color theory of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, moving from left to right. And the intersection of those colors overlaid in a very absorbent black paper um, and then redacted so that I could make some sense out of the, uh, of the jungle gym-like um, maze that resulted. Uh, that opened up a lot of thinking. The, the losing offered opportunity. And here on the, on the drawing table, we have different scales of, of the plans, the respective plans for each threshold, and a small study where the th different identi identified color thresholds are located. One of those opportunities was a painting titled Threshold Fragments Matrix Spectrum with Gray. And it was the first, the first of the set of matrix paintings and um, offered the start. Uh, I then took the painting back after it was exhibited. I don't usually do that, but this was an exception that was deserved because I found a new way to think about spectrum and a, a new way to understand um, this difference of transparency and physicality. So. Here's two details, one from the earlier moment where the color is organized, Roy G. Biv, and on the right, a, a, a detail of that same surface, revised, quieted, edited, dissolved, literally um, sort of gradually taking the paint, lifting the paint back out of the canvas, and then adding onto a kind of raised, um, the, the, those moments that are more saturated color are mimicking the edges of the plans that came after the original um, set of uh, diagrams of the templates. It's almost as though there's a kind of embroidery um, surface and the chance that that color intersects in a different order is because it goes from east to west. So what was the furthest left red is, is, was then overlaid with orange, and orange was overlaid with red at the center, and so on. Things were shifted. Two installation views from the exhibition at DePaul Art Museum. Um, on the left, one, uh, one half of the first gallery that had the six individual threshold paintings. And then in the second gallery, um, the paintings of paintings. So I, in a sense, I understood this before the exhibition at DePaul, but the installation uh, allowed me to understand what that break had, what that step had taken, that uh, the individual paintings had themselves generated another kind of color system and another, uh, another set of subjects. Um, paintings of places and paintings of paintings of places is maybe a way for, to think about it. 
Concurrent with the DePaul exhibition, I was um, invited to curate an exhibition from their collection in relation to the Chicago Architecture Biennial in 2019 and 2020. And um, the DePaul Art Museum is fortunate to have been gifted with significant holdings of works on paper of certain um, architectural um, significant buildings in Chicago as well as um, uh, Piranesi, uh, many of Piranesi's prints from Rome that are annotated in the margins, um, remarkable collection of architectural drawings. In discussion with Julie Rodriguez Whitholm and her um, curatorial staff, I proposed to partner the architectural drawings with uh, a set of, of uh, music notations by the co uh, composer, contemporary composer, Andrew Norman. Uh, Richard and I had met Andrew in Rome the year that we were there in 2007, six and seven. And remarkably, he gave a sh what's called a shop talk at the academy and um, presented uh, audio files of composed works based on architecture. I didn't know his work before then. And uh, one of them was based on the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. While he was in Rome, he did the first of what became a remarkable set of individual composed pieces indicating his experience of specific churches or um, religious uh, sites in Rome as a collective uh, title, a companion guide to Rome. So in this hallway on the right were architectural drawings, and on the left were Andrew's uh, early sketches as well as the final printed scores for a companion guide to Rome, as well as um, Anne Lancelotti's um, excerpts from her thesis that she had written and is a um, significant composer. She studied with Andrew Norman, did her thesis on the Companion Guide to Rome, and, um, in, and those two collaborated um, and agreed that I could present their work in this adjacent way. This is an image that was sent to me by, uh, by email from Anne Lancelotti. And I had not seen this work. I had heard the, the um, individual piece of work attributed to the space of Sant Ivo, uh, designed by Borromini while we were in Rome. That was one of the first works that Andrew composed. But what astonished me was that in his score, um, he included an, an image, a musical notation that is the floor plan of Sant Ivo. So those of you who have been fortunate to visit you know, might recognize that moment. Um, and when, when Anne sent that image, I, I couldn't believe it. It, was, uh, it clinched this idea that um, his work needed to be opposite these works on paper. Here we have a view of Van, Mies van der Rohe's um, uh, Farnsworth House noted by elevation, and he had done that earlier uh, work that we heard in 2007. At the time of the collaboration with the architecture and music notation, there was also a collaboration with, this, with DePaul's School of Music, and um, Michael Lewanski rehearsed the um, students, uh, serious music students that were going to perform some of and, and Andrew's music for a performance. I was at the rehearsal, and I hadn't seen the, um, the score, and looked over his shoulder, uh, Michael, Michael's shoulder as he was conducting, and here was this drawing um, that corresponded to the south and east. There were also pages for north and west in, in Andrew's in, in the sheet music for that work. 
we gave a shared presentation in advance of the concert in, Jan in January of 2020. And I included two details of related works. On the left, you'll recognize that um, study for the North uh, Threshold, and a detail from a subsequent painting in which I had taken the um, structure of the staff lines of music and the structure of a hexagonal um, tile form as well as a hexagonal light fixture that is a feature in our home, and included the, uh, the prospect that the hexagon could be understood as a sounding experience, as a, as a note or a tone um, that traversed the upper section. So the upper section of this painting um, moves along east to west, orange to green. This was, this, this was the stairs and the stairs. You're on the second floor, the six thresholds, fragments of plan. And in the lower register, a what I call a chord structure, as a C-H-O-R-D chord structure, um, indicating left and right aligned with the left and right side of each of those six pairs of threshold markers. Um, the place of orange in relation to the place of yellow to blue, etc., along with their uh, partner complementary colors. And at the, at the conclusion of each threshold's chord structure, we get the true tone of orange, we get the true tone of yellow, we get the true tone of blue, etc. It was a color code system that was generated by the painting, and it was a remarkable experience to be dictated by a structure in one's own painting to fulfill the, um, let's call it the musical um, sequence of chords. At the, at, right at the end of the um, exhibition period, the, the exhibition at DePaul had a long run. I was very fortunate. And on February 6th, some of the students um, um, at DePaul, Brent, Francisco, and Annika played uh, one of the um, works of Andrew Normans in relation to um, that second room of paintings that included this particular work of my own, um, a chambered spectrum. I'm looking at time. I'll, are we good to go another few moments? Okay. So I mentioned at the beginning detours and opportunities that arose because of what we all shared at that uh, particular moment in March of 2020 that didn't end and isn't really ended. Um, and on that very moment, that very day that the world stopped, I received an email from Molly Warnock inviting me to write about the work of Martin Barre, a French um, painter, um, 20th century uh, painter, and uh, neither Molly nor I were aware that by the end of the day that I was reading her email that, of course, not only was the world changed, but I would not, I would not see his paintings. So uh, I agreed to do the writing with the understanding that um, I could include the fact in my writing that I wasn't able to see his paintings. I knew his work uh, from documentation, but I had not seen a work in person. But the Art Institute of Chicago did have one of his works, and the doors were closed, the vault was locked, and um, so my way of addressing Barre's work was to read his interviews and um, his writings about his work, and 
invent or engage his conversation with his work by rejoinders from my own notebooks. So you saw the format of the book, tall and thin, and um, the way that I wrote the note, my own notations had very specific line lengths and the designers very graciously and I think interestedly um, figured out a way to um, progress through my notations um, at, at, at turning the page sideways. So just for example, you're reading in response to the invitation, etc., 27th of March, 2020, late night, Chicago, Martin Barre's 67 F13 is locked down. Here in screen, a glow, this TIFT photo file, F13, a quarantined facsimile, counting 30 viral arrows. Another opportunity arose out of the um, fortunate circumstance of having just completed uh, the exhibition with DePaul as well as completed and brought to uh, publication with them in collaboration with them a catalog for their ex the exhibition in 2019 and 2020. That publication taught me a lot. I, was in, I, wasn't, I wasn't the designer, but I was party to the conversations about designing a book about my work. It was a privilege um, and um, a remarkable sort of sh life shift of understanding how a narrative of one's work can be part of a conversation in collaborative terms. So, great experience. Then it was March 20th, or March 2020, and I had had a great conversation with um, one of the lead designers on the DePaul project, Hilary Geller, who several months into um, pandemic decided, because Studio Lab was changing their, uh, the way that they were working with clients, Hilary, um, dedicated her, her time to founding her own um, design practice, Raven Type. So over the course of really starting summer 20, late summer 2020 through all of 2021, uh, I worked very closely with Hillary to develop a partner volume. The f we, we used the same font, the same sort of organizational um, form that had been applied to the uh, design of the publication for DePaul. And I was able to recover um, pre-digital images of a, site, a site-specific project that I had done in 1998 in Chicago, and along with works on paper that were associated with that project, but also importantly, how the hexagonal tile of the floor project in Chicago has continued to be uh, an informative, um, a, a kind of iconography, if you will, of many of the later paintings that, that I had never would have anticipated to follow. Um, in late uh, spring, summer of 2020, I was invited by Gloria Groom, um, uh, curator of 20th century, 19th and 20th century paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, email and telephone call asking if I would be interested in contributing a written uh, commentary about a work by Cezanne for the planned Cezanne retrospective that was in joint um, conversation and curatorial uh, planning well underway with t between the Art Institute of Chicago and Tate, um, Tate Modern, Tate Britain. And I was stunned by the, by the invite and um, thrilled and honored to be 
invited, but of course the museum was closed. And uh, they wanted, they specifically asked, Gloria specifically asked that I would write about a work in their collection. And um, so after several months and the structure of um, the museum being able to accommodate certain kinds of requests, I had the, um, I, was, I was really fortunate to be able to visit the prints and drawing study room on my own with, uh, with Jay Clark, a curator in prints and drawings. Um, she was there with me and it was just the two of us for a while and then remarkably they let me um, be alone and make notes uh, about this remarkable watercolor. And, uh, and I also asked, maybe pushed a bit, but I asked if I could come for a second look. I taught seminars that were frequently called a subject and a second look. And the second look for me is that sort of self-critical check, did, I, did, did it really look like that? Did I really understand it? What did I miss, perhaps maybe most importantly, out of a second look? So they very graciously said yes, come back a second time. So I had a set of notations, I began to write, I went back a second time, entirely had missed um, certain things, and uh, perhaps because the experience w seemed so intimate, it, it seemed to me that the only way I could really begin was to address Cezanne himself. So it's a two-part um, um, contribution in which there's a letter to Cezanne uh, followed by a set of notations, not unlike what I do in my own studio notebooks. They're abbreviated, they're incomplete thoughts, and I, again, this experience of working with designers and editors was a huge learning and, um, in, in, and exciting way for me to think about the pace of looking and how the pace of my, the pace of my pace of looking, I should say, um, my pace of looking and how that could be possibly legible on the page. And so, Tanaz, you've really confirmed that um, somehow came through, so I, I appreciate that. Then really quickly, a race through the, um, what's happened most recently, which began in fairness in 2016 when the, the long used 20 plus years in one room studio um, expanded um, and was renovated and expanded into the small sort of half lot adjacent to the studio. So the previous windows that looked out onto a small space were covered and then that space between the two windows was opened and in the process, on a morning when I might otherwise not have been there, but I was, out of the dirt was this row of bricks that of course was a part of the foundation wall. So what we had astonishingly was that there was a threshold in a wall. And that was so exciting that I, I wrote a friend and said, two amateur archaeologists found a threshold in a wall in a 20th century building. And um, that, that sense of uh, alignment with work that had been underway already for a decade um, and plus, and the bricks of the house that had been subject of other work, there was, um, this expanding sense of that word threshold, that it's, yes, it's a physical place, but it's a, it's a, uh, there's, there's more than one definition to threshold, which led to a uh, very recent work. This was shown last year at David Nolan. We're looking at a, a work on canvas that is one-to-one -one scale of that 
stretch of threshold, 12 inches by 120 inches. And in this instance at David Nolan, overlaid with a schematic structure based on the floor plans of, from the architectural drawings, as well as making use of the chord structure from the chambered rooms with the hexagonal um, stave lines at the top. So paintings generate paintings, structures offer opportunity to um, re -under, reconsider a stable sequence or code system into something that is energetic, um, surprising. So in this instance, the, a strong dominant color has a kind of silent partner. The yellow adjacent to violet is um, muted so as to make a kind of stable structure of each uh, plan. At David Nolan's new um, recently relocated uh, exhibition space on 81st Street, um, there is in each gallery two different fireplaces, um, not functional. And I proposed to surround the, uh, sort of, let's say, finish out the parquet edge of the floor that had been laid on top of the hearth with a um, version of the sequence of spectrum from west to east and east to west. So we're in a room on 81st Street. That if you look at that wall, you're looking west. And um, I, it seemed useful to give the visitor a way to orient the, the spectrum that was inhabiting, for example, that long threshold painting has the same uh, sequence of structures, of, of code system, I should say. So orange meets itself in the center, um, west to east. And the more familiar code you've seen in those several paintings is moving from east to west. The dimensions of each unit are to scale with the slightly different thresholds, spaces, or dimensions of each of those six. And um, most recently, um, which opened last week in Chicago, uh, a second iteration of that uh, long, oh, of that long threshold that uh, is at Rona Hoffman Gallery. Let me see if I can, I wasn't supposed to show my hole. I have a messy desktop, you can see that. <laughs> so, um, very quickly, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I'm supposed to just activate this. Yes. And it ha the Rona's website has Rona Hoffman's website has this remarkable feature where you can zoom, but then you can also travel. So the bricks that you just saw found in the process of renovation are one to one in this painting, 12 by 120 inches. And embedded in each of those bricks is some version of that same plan system borrowed from the painting at David Nolan Gallery, brought to this threshold. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and then and then I answered you, didn't yeah. I? <laughs> so when, Yes and yes, <laughs> uh, but um, I might, I said yes too quick. Obsessive is, um, I, I would call, I would call it just simply being attentive. And after, so we moved to the house in 92, so it's, you know, some decades um, having lived there. I live with, um, with Richard Rizak, who's an artist and a sculptor, and he has done very specific um, adjustments to our living space. Um, the tile that encloses the second floor um, shower, the sequence of those green and white tiles was something I laid out in the living room on the floor and made sure that nothing was going to be redundant or repetitive but yet active and stable enough that it wasn't disorienting. So maybe, you know, fortunately, it's the, it's the opportunity to take the time not to have had to rush it or being also realistic, having to wait until one has the resources to make the adjustments that one wishes to make. So, um, Yes, there have been renovations, um, and yes. I think, I think yes. instead of saying obsessive, I, 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 I was thinking in my head to, to say like sensitive or I have heightened awareness. And and um, but particular, I mean the I I can obsess over a line length in a commentary about Cezanne, you know. So, I'll, and so is that being obsessive, attentive, or is it the result of the, um, the necessity to fit the line into the designer's three columns and have it also still visually sound and appear paced in a way that is true to, to an element that I use just out of um, out of familiarity, maybe in the studio notes, you know, incomplete words, part 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 words, invent invented words sometimes. Yeah, so it's um, gradually over time, rereading one's own words. I find, you know, I I even want to re-edit. Things right, so yeah. So edit. I think editing is obsessive, right? It, I mean, it co it comes into that category because it makes clarity. It's it's to make something clear, particular to its purpose at that time. Yeah. Was there someone else? Yes. You were supposed to be off. I and it's almost like alchemy. Huh. I mean, given the backstory, I mean, your references are incredibly precise. And yet, it, it has the appearance of just, um, and this is going to be put in quotes because I don't mean it, but I can't think of another word. Conventional. Thank you for um, your kind way of saying that. I, um, 
how to, I'm not sure quite how to answer, but I think part of it is, I'll go back to scale and, um, and point of view, that if the, if, I mean, we could go back to the Bloom painting, that sort of hot, saturated, pink-red one. If that was a larger painting and we saw the perimeter, we would see tree, mm -hmm. but we might, and we might not see bloom. Right. So that's where the titling, the words um, intersect with, uh, with, with choice about scale. Mm -hmm. That's maybe, that's one way. The other is, you know, where, what's the scale of the tile or the floor or the, the, you know, the, the ivy on the window was the size of the ivy on the window. I wasn't inventing that, right? right? But what, what assisted me and then also what um, maybe also offers this back and forth that you describe of it being both recognizable and abstract is that we, we don't really see the source. We're not seeing... We're not seeing the ivy plant. We're seeing the shape against the glass as well as light. We're seeing the glass. The fact that there was glass between me and it, the subject, whether it's the frost, the ivy, the fog, the um, there were many paintings with, with of windows, um, and that barrier had hard to see in these um, reproductions digitally projected. But in the experience of the actual painting, mm -hmm. there's an acknowledgment of a layer of something between here and the ivy, as well as the perimeter of, of the painting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in a way that the archaeologist is about the excavation of the things around us and the right. is about the building of, you know, the layers. And, and, and then within the real, kind of imposing your own cosmology or your own built through the kind of hermeneutics of your language of previous work that distances itself from reality is such a beautiful, um, you know, like that's, yeah, that's hmm. close activity. And this is not a question, but it's just maybe a comment or observation. Um, in how the macro and the micro become embedded and how right. in the later work as the scale starts to shift, it becomes bigger that that becomes maybe a more obvious gesture, and right. a more legible less gesture right. that was perhaps evident before as well that becomes right. really legible. Right. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking when you said as the work shifted scale. So the matrix paintings, because they were bringing together a set of, they, they have this odd scale sense because they're literally the same size as the physical individual paintings. So the vertical is the same measure, but the horizontal was just the result of, well, how far do they have to stretch for them to be legible independently without losing each other, right? Um, unbeknownst to me, the proportions of those canvases are also the proportion of the, of the footprint of the, of the house on the property. And I didn't see that until much later. All of those paintings are 30 by 70, pretty consistently. And I didn't focus on the Sleepwalker painting, um, but it's in the publication in, on the on my own website. And that is a vertical stack of, that make a kind of figural form made up of the center elements of each threshold stacked and embodied, um, centered left to right in that same proportion of the house. So very late I started to understand that that 
that stretch was house and that the occupant the occupant was um, and uh, the occupant lived there yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you've all, you've all been very generous with your time. Thank you.